Psalm 96, a pattern for praise. Now, first of all, what we're going to look at here, and I'll get into the backdrop of this in a moment, but it's about praising God for what he has done. And there's many areas that we can praise God for what he has done, and, and many areas that we can use other than our voices to praise God. We praise God through our obedience in many areas, but also, and, and we can kind of take this for granted as well, but just the way we do ministry and even the building. Because, well, in 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 1, there was a queen, the queen of Sheba. And it says in verse 1, Now the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord. So she's heard of these great things that God has done. And she came to test him with hard questions. That speaks that very possibly she was an unbeliever. And she came to Jerusalem with a great retinue, with camels that bore spices, very much gold and precious stones. And when she came to Solomon, she spoke with him about all that was in her heart. So Solomon answered all of her questions, and there was nothing so difficult for the king that he could not explain to her. And when the queen of Sheba had seen all the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he had built, the food on his table, the seating of his servants, the service of his waiters and their apparel, his cupbearers and his entryway by which he went up to the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her. So what she saw was what God was doing. And they were using the things that God had gave them, the God, that God had done for them, that God had provided for him for the purpose of giving glory to him. Verse 6, then she said to the king, it was true report which I heard in my own land about your words and your wisdom. However, I did not believe the words until I came and saw with my own eyes, and indeed the half was not told me. Your wisdom and prosperity exceed the fame which I heard. Happy are your men and happy are your servants who stand continually before you and hear your wisdom. Blessed be the Lord your God, who delighted in you, setting you on the throne of Israel, because the Lord has loved Israel forever. Therefore, he made you king to do justice and righteousness. And so, because of all of these things that God has done and given, they minister, he touched the heart of this woman for the purposes of the Lord. Now, the timing of this particular psalm, at least in our church, well, we're preparing to enter into a time when it comes to our building, either a new lease or a new location. I don't know what it's going to be. We're dealing with the landlord right now. Rents have gone way up, and um, I've had one meeting, but we continue to do these things. But regardless, wherever it is, it needs to be a place that, well, people are able to have a prepared heart as they enter in. It needs to be a, a place that reflects the good things that God wants to do needs to be a place that people can come and sit and hear the word of God, knowing that when they come to whatever place it is, that they are going to hear the word of God. A building is necessary, but what is the proper perspective that we should have concerning these things? Is a building, well, is a building to be a monument to what we have and are doing? Is it to be a symbol of success? Is it to be a thing of pride? Or is it to be a testimony of what God is and will do just simply through a group of people whose hearts are sold out to him. If the last statement is the case, then this place should be a place of praise to God. It should be done, and it should be used to the glory of God. When people enter in, once again, they're of the mindset that they're coming to meet the Lord. Now, the Lord's with them wherever they go, but again, as we enter into this place, should be of the mindset coming to the higher awareness that we are coming into the presence, we are coming into the praise, we are coming into the word of God, and our hearts should be prepared for that. Now, as far as the occasion of Psalm 96, we're not told. Once again, we have an orphan psalm here where we have no author, no author is mentioned in the psalm, but more than likely, it's either a psalm of David or was greatly influenced by David. We're not going to turn there. There's no reason to read it because we'll be reading through Psalm 96. But 1 Chronicles 16, verses 23 through 33, mimic this psalm. And so that psalm was written by David. And so we'll use that as a backdrop. And the occasion was, the occasion was the ark. The dwelling place of God. Remember the Ark of the Covenant? To the Jewish mind, that was the throne of God. 
And, and the throne of God, as it would be entering into the city, entering into Jerusalem, the capital of Israel, here we are. God has blessed us. We, we have this king, but now we have the king of kings and the Lord of lords. God is dwelling amongst his people. That's the mindset. And as that ark came in, they were worshiping and they were praising and they were glorifying God with, through the, the, the knowledge of the presence of God and the realization of the works of God should come the praising of God. And that's what the people were doing on that entry. But also Psalm 96, I don't know why it is, has no author written. Again, it may not be that this was authored by David, although the words were previously written, but somebody at some place decided, at some point, decided to bring this into this theocratic song. Remember theocratic song? All these psalms have been theocratic as far as in the beginning of the 90s, Psalm 90 and on, and they're recognizing that God is seated upon the throne. And so that throne, to the Jewish mind back in David's day in First Chronicles chapter 16, was brought in from obed Bidon, and now he is in Jerusalem. So just think of what that would mean. Number one, the presence of God, God rendering his judgments, God watching over his people, the, the realization that if God is for us, nobody can be against us. Well, if God's dwelling in the midst of us, how could anybody be against us? Unfortunately, um, God's people would take that for granted. And so keep all in mind what was going on during that time. There's always the critics. Remember my call, David's wife, she put him down for dancing in front of the ark. David was filled with joy and filled with praise, and he just let loose before the people and before the Lord, just praising him and worshiping him. But you'll always have the critics. You always have the critics. We've had critics as far as the songs that we sing, and they're just be amazed how people can criticize things. But really, in actuality, what they're doing, as long as we're following the word of God and the praise of God, they're criticizing the Lord and not so much the people. There were the cynical people, the people who never really enter in. They just kind of sit on the outside. And there were those who looked on the outward appearance, but they haven't seen the heart. And it's the Lord who sees the heart. And so really, and I'm not here, and we ought not to be here, to reveal our heart to one another, that's a performance. We're here to praise and to reveal our heart to God. Because, God, I've been through this week, and, you know, we've got work and family. We've just had the prayer request of everything that is going on. Now we've entered into the realization of once again we're in the presence of God, reevaluating the things that are going on, reevaluating where I am in my walk with the Lord, remembering the things that God has done, is doing, and is going to do, and all that should be reflected in our praising of the Lord. So it's with a heart that overflows with joy of the Lord that we have King David, praising God with all of his strength as he dances, singing. And last week we saw singing. Singing is to be an emotional expression of a joyful human thought. And so David in his mind, because God created his mind, he gave us our minds for the purpose of honoring him. He's realizing what this means, and so he's singing. We see that he's got joy in his heart, understanding that God is taking up residence amongst his people. Well, if David had such joy, and it caused him to praise God to that degree, knowing that this ark was amongst God's people, how much more so should we be joyful praising God, knowing that God dwells inside of here. God dwells inside of Pastor Mike. I should rejoice because of that. No, rejoice because God dwells inside of you. We are a temple of the Holy Spirit. Just, just imagine that. God has made the decision, and it's for your benefit, to dwell within you. And it just should be an amazing thing that should just really, well, it, it's then that... It, Praise is not to be fostered by me according to my ability and even according to my opinion, but as all I want to do is, is to give myself over to the leading of the Spirit and allow the Spirit to move through me, to have that joyful mind and have Him use it as that conduit for praising and worshiping God. Praising and worshiping God that expresses that heart 
but also prayerfully leads others as well, or at least encourages others. John Stott, he said, true worship is the highest and noblest activity which man, by the grace of God, is capable of. Well, according to what John Stott said, and there's truths here, this is the most, one of the most noble things that we are able to do. And again, you have free license to do this. You, you, you're amongst the congregation. You know, I pointed out last week, go and stand up in the middle of the mall and start singing out and they think you're crazy. Come in here and sing out, and it's expected even. There's nowhere else that you can do that in, in a public manner. And God... God invites us in, and God desires that. He's desirous of your praise. And so it, it really is, is given to him in so many ways, a life that, is, again, is obedient to the Lord, one who shares the word, one who sings out a song and even a place, this place here in Ontario, a place in Jerusalem, that temple during that time, but it was all for the purpose of praising and glorifying God. And so we come to the first stanza, verses 1 through 3, and what we have here is, is an invitation. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among all peoples. And so notice the verbiage that David gives here as he desires not just to be up there dancing and singing by himself but others to join in and so oh sing to the Lord a new song sing to the Lord so praise praise is to sing out again it, it's that that God has given us that, that's just amazing I was watching this guy on YouTube the other day he was playing guitar he was a guitar teacher he wasn't a, well, I don't know if he was a Christian or not, but nonetheless. But just as he's going through music theory and things I don't understand, but very interested in, and, and just going through all of these things and these details and, and just how this man was putting these melodies together and whatnot, and I was just looking at it and just thinking how amazing music is. Uh, I, I was watching... Um, uh, it was an old-time NFL little thing that was on YouTube or somewhere. I don't remember where. And one of the, it was um, Mean Joe Green, I think, from the Pittsburgh Steelers from back in the 70s. They were asked how he prepares for a game. And one of the things he does just before he goes out on the field, he puts his headphones out and he cranks up whatever music he listened to. And he says, it gets me all fired up. Well, this is to get us all fired up for the Lord. And, you know, and so we see, again, he's not using it to glorify God there, but we see how it is meant, how it was intended by God to glorify himself, to motivate his people. You know, again, you hear an inspiring song, and it just does something to you. I can remember it was in 1991. We were at, I think it was called the Pacific Amphitheater in Costa Mesa. We were, it was Harvest Crusade, and Harvest Crusade had just ended, and they had the team go back up there, and they were playing. This was loud, and you know how loud, it, it's just not just loud, but it was also how the, the sound waves kind of bounce off your chest. And I just never forget they played Awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. And I just remember thinking how powerful that is. But, you know, the power... The power is in that God has ordained this to glorify him, and we need to see it. I've been to plenty of secular concerts. We've gotten all excited about some secular band, not for the glory of God, but I see that this avenue of worship and the proper usage, not saying that you shouldn't go to concerts and enjoy other forms of music. It's not what I'm saying at all, but recognize the power of it and the intent of it to glorify God. And so, oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Sing to the Lord. And it says in the midst of that, bless his name. Remember, God blessing us is him doing well for us. Us blessing him is us speaking well of all that God has done. It says, proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. It doesn't say debate here because we can so easily be misled and enter into debates or arguments. or Just proclaim it. 
That's all we've ever been commanded to do is to proclaim these things that God has done. He uses another term that pretty much means the same thing. Declare his glory amongst the nations, his wonders amongst all the peoples. And so the psalmist is doing these things and desires others to come alongside of him and do the same thing. And so really what you're seeing here is David, this facet of him as a worship leader. And so two things that you need to see as far as being a a worship leader, and the two worship leaders aren't just sitting there. We're all called to be worship leaders. We're all called to be worship leaders. First, you need to be the leader in your own life, but also in those whom you're able to influence. And so in order to be an effective worship leader, first, you have to enter in yourself. I remember there was a worship leader, not Paul and Joanne, but this was many years ago. They asked, now, are we up there leading people or are we up there worshiping ourselves? Well, how can you lead people if you're not worshiping yourself? You have to first be able to enter in to worship yourself. Now, at some point, I mistook my, my calling. I was a pastor. Shut up, Sean. <laughs> I was a pastor, but, well, it wasn't a mistake. God used it. We had a men's study, and the person that was leading worship couldn't lead worship any longer, and nobody else played guitar at that point. So I brought my guitar and started playing my guitar. Problem is I can't really play guitar, but I learned some songs and uh, did a passable job, I, I guess. But that was one of the things that I realized, and we eventually kind of put this worship team together, and it was a really fun thing. Um, it, it was a thing that I learned a lot as far as what was involved in worship. And we did a couple of Sunday nights from what I remember. And one of the things that I remember is, is that just even playing the guitar and just there and just giving that to God and, and just worshiping God as I did that. And then finally God asked me, he goes, do you want to be a worship leader or do you want to be a pastor? Because you can't do both. And so I was given a lot of time over to that, and it's something I needed to pull back from and put my efforts elsewhere. But I learned. I learned the mechanics of it, but I also learned how if if I'm just doing this to do it, or if I'm doing this just for you to enter in, there's something missing. I have to first enter in myself. So first you enter in yourselves because you can't lead others where you are unwilling to go. Every great leader, it was the Civil War and James Longstreet. He was, one of the made, he was one of the prime generals of General Lee. Lee had lost um, Stonewall Jackson, and, and so he was leaning heavily upon Longstreet. Longstreet had a habit of going too far towards the front, and Lee was afraid he was going to get hurt because he couldn't afford to lose another general. Well, lo and behold, one day he went out front and he got shot. He didn't get killed. He just got wounded and brought back. And Lee told him, I told you not to go out in the front like that. And his response was very plain and simple. You can't lead from the rear. You can't push forward, people forward, not in an inspiring manner. You must step out first yourself. And if you step out first yourself, it's of the Lord, then people will follow. And again, that leads to the second thing is first, the entering in yourself. Secondly, is the encouragement of others. Our time of worship is not entertainment, but it is purposeful and personal. There's a purpose to it. We're worshiping God. We've set this time apart, but it is to be personal. Just as I'm saying the worship team needs to enter in, we need to enter in as well. But just think this building, as we have people up here leading worship, and they've entered into a spirit of worship before God, And as you enter into a spirit of worship before God, isn't there just something special, something intimate about that? Something that just, man, that was just, and I don't know, you know, sometimes I can't explain things, and it was just good. You just know that it was good. So what the psalmist is doing is encouraging others to, well, we see it here, and we've seen it many other places, oh, sing to the Lord a new song. To sing a new song is to praise God because of a fresh awareness of grace or fresh awareness of what God is doing. And so David is seeing God do a new thing. He's coming into Jerusalem. David, it's under his rule. And it's not that David's causing it to happen, but he's realizing that this is a blessing from God. And so the idea is singing a new song because here comes God, the the throne of God, and God is going to dwell amongst his people. You, You should be of that mindset. Maybe you have. 
Maybe you just received some kind of blessing from God and you know you didn't deserve it, whatever, and you just praise God out. Well, that's the idea of singing a new song. Now, I've heard that phrase defined as, well, hey, I, I wrote a new song today. It can be the same song, the same song sang over and over, but the idea is from a fresh perspective. Have you seen the words up on the screen? Yeah, I, I never noticed that about that psalm, song before. Well, the reason you probably never noticed some particular phrasing or words or, or the intent of the author of the song is because you've experienced God in a new way. And now you're singing a new song. It might be the same old song, but you're singing this new song because there's this fresh awareness of God. And so we have to be aware of that. There's the ultimate picture of this that we have in the book of Revelation, chapter 5, verses 9 through 10. It says, And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. And so there's the church in heaven, and they've seen Jesus take the scroll. Now keep in mind, this is the church in heaven. Now you get to heaven, you made it. What greater blessing can you receive? But then there's the realization before them of all that Christ had done as far as the cross, the death, and the resurrection. And now they see that he has paid the price and received possession of the earth. Because you look at the earth today, Who's got possession of it? Now, we know ultimately God's in control, but the God of this age sure seems like he's been busy doing a work here, the devil. But here, just now this is during the time when evil has increased, and it's going to continue to increase all the way through to the tribulation, and then it's going to explode. And so these are the saints in heaven realizing the evil, but now all of a sudden, God's rising up. God's going to do a new thing. And so what are the saints in heaven doing? They're singing a new song because here's a fresh awareness of the grace of God because everybody down there on earth at that time, they deserve judgment. But what is God doing? Remember the tribulation? It starts at the point of the rapture. The rapture comes and there's not one saved born again believer on earth. But because of our testimony, because of Calvary Chapel Ontario's YouTube channel or Facebook channel, people still get the word. The Bibles are still here. People are going to, you know, the things that maybe you said before as far as what was going to happen, now these things are going to happen in the rapture and now the tribulation is starting. They're going to realize these things and come into a relationship with God. And God's going to do a new thing with those people are there. And so the tribulation, remember the definition of tribulation? It's a squeezing. Tribulation isn't punishment. They're going to go to hell. What good does it do to torment them and then send them to hell? But what God is doing is he's using that tribulation to squeeze them, to squeeze out any born-again believers who would come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so he intensifies these things. And so a lot of times what you'll see, you see it in chapter 16. And they did not repent of their works, but they cursed God. And so when it says they did not repent, that means that they could have repented. They could have gotten right with Jesus Christ. And so that's what the tribulation, the squeezing was meant to do. And so what are the saints in heaven? This is an amazing expression of God's grace. Those people, they deserve death. But what is God doing? He's doing this final work before he ends everything to, so that those people may be able to spend eternity with him. And so the saints in heaven, when they're understanding the magnitude of all this, they sing a new song. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Notice the psalmist's encouragement, or his encouragement, is for all the earth to hear. The song of the Lord is to begin in our hearts and grow into a chorus in which all are included. Praise is to be personal, has to start there, but it is to be infectious as well. I don't remember, I was, we, my wife and I, we were driving somewhere, and you, you're not going to believe this, but don't let it devaluate your opinion of her, but she told me to shut up. Why did she tell me to shut up? And she may not have said the word shut up. I think she said to stop because I was singing some stupid song that I had heard. You know how when you sing a song, it's infectious. It's in your brain. You know, they call them hooks. 
And so that was in, you know, it was some stupid secular song from the 50s or something. I don't even, maybe, oh, it was a Christmas carol. The problem was it was week after Christmas. But I think I was singing Winter Wonderland. But anyway, she says, Christmas is over. It's enough. And, uh, but, you know, it, it, it's amazing how that is because she's worried that she's going to start singing it. You know, how, you, you just, it's just infectious. That's how God has created song to be. And so the praising of God, it is to be infectious. Again, same thing. I got home from, from church. Uh, it was yesterday when I got in. I, rem- I was singing this song, just this one portion of the song over and over. And at this time, it was a praise song. And it was just because I had heard it, and it's infectious. And, you know, it, it just, it's just something about that. There's just, I can't describe it any other way. There's just something about it. And the only way you know is to enter in. But as you enter in, you'll lead other people. They will enter in as well. Verse 3, declare his glory amongst the nations, his wonders amongst all the peoples. Now we enter into the second stanza, verses 4 through 6, and we see an identification. For the Lord is great, identifying who God is. The Lord is great and greatly to be praised, for he is to be feared above all gods. Notice that small g, gods. For all the gods of the people are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. For proper praise, there must be a right identification of the one whom praise is directed towards. Now, again, I've been to those secular concerts, and what were they doing? Well, a lot of times they were praising the people on stage, you know, on top of the seat, raising arms, lighting the cigarette lighters, and, you know, just all of these things, and praising the people. The problem was, well, what, we even have a TV show. What is it called? I don't know if it's still on or not. American Idol. But what is an idol? An idol, what does the word idol actually mean? That, that word idol? That word idol means nothing, nothing. An idol is absolutely, in the sight of God, it's nothing. And so, again, this is a theocratic song, the recognition of the sovereignty of God. The backdrop is God is ruler of all the universe. He is king of kings and lord of lords. And this stanza, the psalmist looks at the world and who they have chosen to worship. And it's because of whom God is. He is to be feared above all of the other gods that have been made or fostered by mankind. Proverbs 8.13, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil pride and arrogance and the evil way. Why are the other gods not to be feared? Psalm 96 verse 5, for all the gods of the people are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Now, he's kind of, the, the writer of Psalm, well, David as he penned it back in uh, First Chronicles chapter 16, he kind of did this little play on words. For all the Elohims, all the gods, Elohims are the people, are Elilims. Elilim, again, means it's defined as idols, but it means nothing. Their gods are nothing. So if their gods are nothing, then what really is the big deal as far as idolatry? Because, and it's partly because you're not giving God the praise due to him, but you're giving, that's the problem, you're giving that which is due to him over to nothing. It's just simply a waste. There's no benefit whatsoever. Habakkuk, 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 chapter 2, verse 18, what profit is the image that its maker should carve it the molded image, a teacher of lies, that the maker of its mold should trust in it to make mute idols. And so look at the idols, even the idols of our days, people who praise somebody like Buddha, Muhammad, or whatever it is that man praises, even himself, they're all Elilims, they're all nothings. They can do absolutely nothing for the person. Matter of fact, they're going to be demanding of that person rather than, if you will, ministering to that person. Who is the Christian? Well, the Christian is who God has made us to be. He has saved us. He has redeemed us. He has justified us. And there's going to come the time that he is going to glorify us. 2 Corinthians 3, 5, Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being of ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. 
And so his point, these idols are made from what God has first made. He's gone and he's cut down a tree. He uses part of that tree to burn a fire and to cook his food. And from another, he forms an idol that is absolutely nothing and once again can do absolutely nothing. Third stanza, verses 7 through 9, it's an inspiration. Give to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory to his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. O oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. The third stanza has to do with the encouragement to give God his due. Notice again verses 7 and 8. Three times give. He's making this point here. Give to the Lord. Give his due. The word peoples here. The word peoples, give to the Lord families of the peoples, which could also be translated nations. This is to be inclusive, not just of Israel, but this is to be conclusive of all the peoples of the earth. When you look in the, in the scriptures, and you look at, even in Revelation, the people that are in heaven are from all nations, all tribes, all tongues. Matter of fact, in chapter 5, verse 9, again, in the book of Revelation, it says, they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue, people and nation. Every, pro every tribe means every descent, every tongue means every language, every people means every race, and every nation means every culture. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God desires that all men would be saved. All of mankind would be saved. Jesus has redeemed us. He's brought, he bought us in the marketplace, and now he has set us free. And so why praise him? Well, we could go through the Bible and just find many places, but I'll just look at one in Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, and you. Now, when he says you, it's plural. It means y'all. He's not from the south, so he didn't say y'all. But you, he made alive who were formerly dead. Now, we weren't dead because we were here, but we were spiritually dead. We had no desire for the Lord and the things of the Lord, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the counts or the course of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just as others. That means you were destined for destruction. You were spiritually dead. That means you had absolutely no fellowship with God. Matter of fact, your God was the devil. That's what he's saying in verses 2 in the first part of verse 3. And your nature, your nature, you were headed for destruction. You needed to be redeemed. Verse 4, again, there's those two words, but God. And one of these days, I'm going to do a word study in all the places, I say this every time, um, but God. Because the idea here is, that's what things used to be like, but there was a turning point. There was a point of transition or transformation, and it was God. But God, God entered into the equation, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, even when you were an enemy of God, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceedingly riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. There's a good reason to praise the Lord, regardless of who you are, regardless of where you have come from, because whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, whoever it might be, you before Christ were dead in your sins and your trespasses. But God entered in, and what did he do? He made you alive. He put forth the effort. He made the decision. He looked at you back up in Ephesians chapter 1. He chose you, and he adopted you. Now, I've seen people, even in our church, that I'm not sure that I would have chosen them. 
I look in the mirror and I wonder sometimes why God even chose me. But he didn't just choose me. He didn't just going to make me just some kind of slave up in heaven. He chose me for the purpose of bringing us into his family. Praise God for that. Don't, don't ever forget that. Don't ever take that for granted. And so the encouragement here is, is because of what we have received, is to give back to God just the only way that, it's the only way that you can possibly repay him. And even then it falls way short, but just praise him. Praise is always giving and not receiving. Receiving of praise, that's entertainment. You come and you pay your money and you receive an hour worth of entertainment. But to come into the church is to be giving. Again, if you come to church and you're wanting to receive something, you're probably going to be disappointed. If you come to church with the mindset of giving something, I guarantee you, you're going to leave filled because that's the essence of what ministry is, especially amongst the gathering together of the brethren. And what we are to give is, is the glory. What does it mean to give glory to God? To give glory to God is just to reflect that which he has shown upon me. And the way that I can best reflect the glory of God is to live a life according to God's words, is to be obedient to his call and have a heart for his ways. The fourth stanza, the last one, We've seen an invitation, identification, inspiration, and an interaction. Verses 10 through 13. Say amongst the nations, the Lord reigns. The world also is firmly established. It shall not be moved. He shall judge the peoples righteously. Let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad. Let the sea roar in all of its fullness. Let the field be joyful in all that is in it. Then all the trees of the woods will rejoice before the Lord, for he is coming, for he is coming to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with truth. The last verse once again reminds us of this theocratic rule of God. It, it reminds us of the present theocratic rule of God, that God right now is seated upon the throne. David's day, he remembered God is seated upon the throne and the things that he does. Matter of fact, a lot of the things that were mentioned just speak of his creation as it reveals God and the power of God. Psalm 93, verse 1, the Lord reigns, he is clothed with majesty. 97, 1, the Lord reigns, let the earth rejoice, let the multitude of isles be glad. 99, 1, he, reign, he, the Lord reigns, let the peoples tremble. He dwells between the cherubim, that would speak of the ark once again, let the earth be moved. And then again, his eternal theocratic rule Verse 13, for he is coming, for he is coming to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the people with his truth. In the book of Revelation, chapter 19, verses 6 through 7, John said, the apostle John, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters and the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. Now, what's good about speaking about worship and praise, especially from this platform and at this time, we're able to have a test. And so this is a study that we're going to give you a test afterwards. The worship leaders are going to come, and I'm not testing you, but... Are you able to give of your praise to God? Are you able, based upon, not what I've said so much, but what God has said through the word here tonight, are you able to praise him? If you're sitting at home watching on the internet, are you able to praise him in this last song? Are you able to just sing out? Are you able to recognize the words and the words that you're saying, not just because they rhyme or the melody or the beat of the music or any of that, all these things, again, are just avenues between your heart and God's ear. And God desires that you would praise him. He wants to hear from you. Father, once again, I pray that our praise, that our worship, Lord, would be pure, 
Father, we're an imperfect people, but God, you have made us to be as kings and priests. And so, Lord, it's all about the great work that you have done. And so, Father, our praise, our worship is to be a reflection of that. And so, Father, I just pray even this last song that we would sing it out and, God, you would just simply be glorified. We thank you for your word and I just pray, Father, for the things that we've looked at. And, Lord, just thinking of all the things that were said tonight, just in these 13 verses, there's a book full of these things. And I pray, Father, as we study your word, we would see the various areas of praise and worship and how they can be incorporated into our lives. And it's not that we would do better, but we would just be open once again to be, to be witnesses of your glory. And so, Father, we just thank you for this evening. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for the knowledge of who you are, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you all stand, please?